number five, the Mary Celeste. Probably the most famous mystery ship on our list today is the Mary Celeste, a merchant brigantine that was found drifting in December of 1872 off of the Azores with her crew of 10 nowhere to be found. The Canadian brigantine De Gratia found her in a disheveled but seaworthy condition under partial sail and with her lifeboat missing. There were also signs that something had gone wrong. To be specific, one of its pumps was dismantled, but once again, that ship was still seaworthy, and there was no hint as to why the crew and passengers had abandoned it. The last entry in her log was dated around 10 days earlier. She had left New York City for Genoa on November 7th, and was still amply provisioned when found. Her cargo of alcohol was intact, and the captain's and crew's belongings were undisturbed. None of those who had been on board were ever seen or heard from ever again. Among the missing was the captain, his wife, and their very young daughter. On December 23rd of 1872, during a court hearing to try and establish just what happened, Frederick Soliflud, who was the Attorney General of Gibraltar, ordered an examination of the Mary Celeste, which was carried out by John Austin, surveyor of shipping, with the assistance of a diver, Ricardo Portunato. Austin noted cuts on each side of the bow, caused by a sharp instrument, and found possible traces of scarlet fluid on the captain's Sword. His report emphasized that the ship did not appear to have been struck by heavy weather, citing a vial of sewing machine oil found upright in its place. Now, Austin did not acknowledge that the vial might have been replaced since the abandonment, nor did the court raise this point. Fortunato's report on the hull concluded that the ship had not been involved in a collision or run aground. A further inspection by a group of Royal Naval Captains endorsed Austin's opinion that the cuts on the bow had been caused deliberately. They also discovered stains on one of the ship's rails that might have been bodily fluids, together with a deep mark possibly caused by an axe. These findings strengthened Flood's suspicions that human wrongdoing, rather than natural disaster, was uh, the cause for the mystery. On January 22nd of 1873, he sent the reports to the Board of Trade in London, adding his own conclusion that the crew had gotten at the alcohol on board and, you know, killed the Briggs family and the ship's officers in a drunken frenzy. They had cut the bows to simulate a collision and then fled in the yawl to suffer an unknown fate. Flood thought that Morehouse and his men were hiding something, specifically that the Mary Celeste had been abandoned in a more easterly location and that the log had been doctored. He just couldn't accept that the Mary Celeste could have been traveled so far well uncrewed. Arthur Conan Doyle, author of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, helped make the ship famous with a short story vaguely based on the event, in which foul play explains the enigma. A 2007 theory, reported by the Smithsonian, suggests that perhaps the captain made the call to abandon ship in sight of land after the ship's pumps became fouled. Normally, it would be unusual for a captain to abandon a seaworthy vessel, but the captain may not have been able to tell just how much water the ship was taking on with the pumps broken. The ship was also slightly off course and had been battling bad weather, which may have prompted the captain to take the chance at land when he could. To this day, the crew of the mysterious vessel was never found. Also, despite many theories, no one can say with any certainty why the ship was abandoned. The Mary Celeste sailed for 12 years after it was abandoned, and uh, finally struck the Rochelet Reef off of the coast of Haiti and became stuck there. And it's still there. It was discovered in 2001. Let me know what your theory is in the comments. Number four, the Carol A. Deering. This ship was built in Bath, Maine in 1919 by the GG Deering Company for commercial use. One of the last large commercial sailings vessels, the ship was designed to carry cargo and had been in service for a year when it began its final voyage to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So the cargo ship and its 10-man crew successfully made it to Rio de Janeiro in 1920, despite needing to change captains when its original one fell ill. But something strange happened on its way back to Virginia. A light shipkeeper in North Carolina said a crewman who didn't seem very officer-like reported the ship had lost its anchors while the rest of the crew was milling about suspiciously. The ship was still in good condition when it was spotted from Cape Hatteras on January 31st of 1921 before it was torn apart on the Diamond Shoals. Another ship spotted the Carol A. Deering near Outer Banks the next day in an area that would have been a strange course for a ship on its way to Norfolk, Virginia. Now, if someone wants to fight me on that pronunciation, I swear I consulted a couple of friends who live in Virginia for that one. The following day, a shipwreck was spotted, but dangerous conditions kept investigators away for four days. When they went aboard, eventually, they found food laid out as if they were getting ready for a meal, but the crew's personal belongings and the lifeboats were gone. So what happened to the captain and crew? All 12 men were missing in action, with no idea what the heck could have transpired. A month after the Coast Guard began investigating the Carol A. Deering, a new theory was formed related to the disappearance of another vessel, the Hewitt, around, you know, the same time. The Hewitt was making its way from Sabine, Texas to Portland, Maine, carrying a cargo of sulfur when it sent its last message on January 25th off of the coast of Florida. When the vessel never arrived in Boston, where it was expected on January 29th, a search began. The Hewitt and her crew had also disappeared without a trace, and the popular theory questioned if the ships could have collided. 
but the lack of oars, life preservers, or other floating wreckage disproves the idea. But 58 men were now lost. In April of 1921, a message in a bottle found by a man on the North Carolina coast seemed to give the answer to the mystery. Deering captured by oil burning boat, the note read. Now the State Department began an investigation into the Deering and several other ships, and it was suspected that the Deering had been captured by pirates. Arr. Then the newspapers began reporting the possibility of a Bolshevik plot to steal the ships, cargo and crews, and somehow whisk them all away to Russian ports. By September, however, it was discovered that the message found in the bottle, the only real evidence of what may have happened to the crew, was in fact written by the man who supposedly found it. Mr. Christopher Columbus Gray faked the note in the hopes that he could discredit the staff at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse and take someone's job. It's a dramatic way to get a job, but hey, whatever works. The hopes have prompted investigations by the US Navy, Treasury, State Department, Department of Commerce, and Department of Justice. Without the note, however, the investigations fizzled out and ended without an official explanation. The federal government has followed numerous leads on pirates, mutinies, and more, but uh, they've got nothing. So do I. Coming in at number three, we've got the ghost ship of the Northumberland Strait. Yes, Canadian ghost pirates. That pretty much sums up my career aspirations right there. I don't know if that means I would be pirating software related to ghosts or actually becoming a phantom upon the Northumberland Strait, but I don't really care as long as my title involves the words Canadian, ghost, and pirate. But back to the actual tale at hand. This ghost ship is said to sail when it's on fire within the Northumberland Strait. What is the Northumberland Strait? It is a body of water that separates Prince Edward Island from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in eastern Canada. Now you all know some Canadian geography. I'm so proud of you. The story dates back over 200 years when people started reporting a beautiful schooner catching fire and being engulfed in flames as people watched from shore. Anyone who has ever attempted a rescue mission finds that the ship completely disappears before they can reach it. Apparently the ship shows up before a northeast wind, forewarning terrible storms. Some say it's just an example of St. Elmo's fire, a rare weather condition involving the ionization of air molecules in order to produce a faint glow, but those who have seen the ship ablaze say that it was much too bright to be explained away like that. The prevailing story is that a pirate made a pact with the devil to protect and hide his treasure, and in return, he and his crew would sail forever on the burning ship. A pact was made as the ship was burning down and would soon sink along with the treasure. In the end, folks claim that their fate was revenge for the terrible deeds they had done in their days of piracy, like their own personal floating hell. Coming in at number two, we have Baron Falkenberg. A tale of lovers scorned, brothers bashed, and dice rolled. This pirate haunts Germany's North Sea and has been for over 600 years. Baron Falkenberg was a relatively wealthy member of high society, planning to propose to the village's most beautiful maiden. Then his long lost brother returned with newly found riches and proposed to her first. At the wedding, the Baron became so upset with his brother that he clubbed him over the head with a bottle of champagne. Classy. Naturally, the brother dropped dead. Seeing this, his bride ran away, claiming that she'd rather die than be with the Baron. Ouch. So the Baron did what any rational fratricidal maniac would do, and stabbed her in the heart. How romantic. Then he ran away to the beach where he was accosted by a shady man on a boat. This mysterious figure invited him to the ship where he came from, which was anchored offshore a little ways out. The Baron accepted and rode his way to the great grey behemoth. Since entering, nobody has seen him disembark and he's been at sea for centuries. The ship he boarded always seems to be heading due north and flickers of blue flame. Some passers-by claim to have seen the Baron himself playing dice with the devil in order to take back control of his soul. Unfortunately, it appears to be very difficult to win a game of chance against the devil. An additional caveat that can be added is that there are those who will claim that the story of the Baron is also connected to a Norse ghost story. The story tells the tale of a Viking sea captain who stole a magic ring from the gods. As punishment for his crimes, he was turned into a living skeleton covered in fire, condemned to spend the rest of eternity affixed to the mast of a ghostly longship. Whether the two stories are about the same ship, it's hard to say. However, I think we can all agree that a flaming skeleton pirate it's pretty badass. And finally at number one, we have the Flying Dutchman. We saved the most well known for last. The legendary ghost ship is said to glow with ghostly light as it sails the seven seas. It will attempt to send messages to land or to people long dead if hailed. 
Unfortunately, nobody really wants to hail this ship, as the sight of it is seen to be a portent of doom. Like most ghostly ships, the Dutchman can never make port and is doomed to sail the oceans forever. It's theorized that the spectral seafarer had been rounding the treacherous Cape of Good Hope when it encountered a sudden storm. The hatches were battened down and the captain swore he would push right through come hell or high water. And it turns out a little bit of both were on the menu. For his recklessness with his ship and crew, the captain was divinely punished. He was condemned to sail the seas for eternity, serving as a warning to other mariners of bad weather and the cost of hubris. Sightings of the Dutchman have been reported since the 18th century, with many notable scallywags and scurvy dogs laying eyes on the ghastly vessel. Even Prince George of Wales described seeing a ship glowing with a strange light. If you see a ship with skeletons dancing in the rigging, steer clear. It might look like fun, but the captain will try to lure other vessels onto the rocks to ensure nobody else can pass the cape. Sheesh. Remind me not to take a long sailing trip. Number 5. The Mary Celeste Our first entry on the list of ghost ships today is the story of the Mary Celeste, a ghost ship where the crew abandoned it for a reason no one knows. In 1872, the captain, one Benjamin Briggs, cast off out of New York's docks to travel to Italy. On board were the captain, his wife, their young daughter, and a small crew of eight seasoned sailors coming with them. The voyage seemed like a success until it was found by another ship, the Del Gradia. The crew of of the Del Gradia approached the Celeste since it was barreling forward at full speed and full sail without anybody manning the crew. So the Del Gradia boarded it to investigate and found more questions than they had before, as there was barely a sign of life. If they hadn't found it freely floating, they would have assumed the ship had just been built. There was a little bit of water in the hold and a lifeboat was missing, but other than that, the ship was fully intact, the hull undamaged, the hold replete with food and water and other supplies. So what happened? Why would the the captain and the crew abandon a perfectly serviceable, well stocked ship, especially one that was carrying his own family. Now, there have been theories over the course of the years. Piracy is a fairly common suggestion, suggesting they were attacked, but if the ship had been raided, why did they leave all the food and water behind and leave the ship freely floating? It's not like a pirate to leave anything valuable behind, anything at all. The ship was still on course to their destination, and the logbook found on board stated that the Mary Celeste was on the right path, so what happened there? They were going the right way. It's worth mentioning that before this strange occurrence, the Mary Celeste already had a checkered history. It was originally known as the Amazon before Jeff Bezos sued. No. It was the Amazon, but it was given a new name after a series of mishaps led crews to believe it was a cursed ship. The first captain died of an extreme sickness, and on one of the first voyages, the Amazon crashed into another ship. So it was renamed the Mary Celeste, hoping perhaps that a new name and a coat of paint could salvage its reputation. If only that was the case. The Celeste was recovered and sailed a few more years before being run down for insurance purposes, and to date, no one knows what ever became of Benjamin Briggs and his crew. And if you're looking for more ghost stories, not necessarily nautical, but ghost stories of any variety, Top 5 Scary has loads of that and then some. We've got just about everything freaky you can think of. So click on through and hit subscribe. Please make sure you hit that bell. But would you kindly do that at the end of this video? Because I got way more stories about haunted ships coming up for you right now. Let's get back into it. Number 4. The Jenny Way back in the era of exploration, when ships sailed across the sea, the South Pole was one of the most treacherous passes an explorer could make, and countless sailors sailed their last expedition around the Antarctic. One such ship is a small schooner called the Jenny. Now, we really don't know much about this ship, the purpose of its original mission, really even who was sailing on it. What we know of the Jenny comes from the post-mortem, when it was found discovered by a whaling ship in the Year 1860. The Hope was sailing through when it spotted a battered schooner, beaten but somehow still sailing around, passing narrowly through the gap between two icebergs. The crew of the Hope closed in. This was quite an odd sight. They recognized the English flag atop the mast and assumed the ship was in grave danger and needed immediate assistance, so they sailed on forward. They saw seven men standing on the deck, although they looked gravely underdressed for the weather conditions and not particularly active at all. These guys were sort of just uh, chilling out up there. It wasn't until the Hope sailed close enough that they realized the men they were looking at on the Jenny weren't just sluggish, but they were frozen remains frozen in place as if they'd been frozen flash solid as if it happened in an instant. They appeared to be in 
mostly good condition. I know that sounds incredibly bizarre to say that about a corpse, but they weren't showing signs of decomposition or any physical injuries. The Hope's captain, Captain Brighton, boarded the Jenny to try and understand what was going on here. He went underneath the decks and found a man slumped over a barrel with a journal in his hands. Brighton went up to touch him but realized immediately like everyone else he had been frozen in place. So he pried the journal from his cold dead hands and read the last chilling entry. Chilling. I didn't even mean to say that. That was a little pun. That's what my comedy degree paid for. May 4th, 1823. No food for 71 days. I am the last one alive. If the log was to be believed, then that would mean the crew had been sailing as corpses aimlessly for decades, as if not a day had passed. Captain Brighton took the journal home with him to return one day. And tragically, the wife of the Jenny's captain was found dead in the bedroom cabin alongside the ship's dog. The Hope sailed off with nothing more than the journal and left the Jenny floating across the frozen water where she may still be to this day, or perhaps she's plunged deep beneath the water. Wherever she is, I hope those men found some peace and hopefully some food. Number three, the Octavius. The cargo ship Octavius met its demise in 1761 after leaving China and setting sail for Britain via the Northwest Passage. At that time, no ship had ever successfully navigated the passage, and uh, the Octavius disappeared, proving it was no exception. A whaling ship discovered the damaged remains of Octavius on October 11th of 1775 and boarded it to look for survivors and cargo. When the men ventured into the below deck quarters, they found the ship's captain frozen at his desk, partway through filling out the ship's log, and the rest of the crew were similarly encased and ice throughout their rooms. Burr. The whalers snatched up the ship log and fled the Octavius, leaving behind all, including the first and last entries, which were uh, stuck to the desk. The log revealed that the Arctic temperatures and ice captured the Octavius around 250 miles from Barrow, where all those aboard perished on November 11th of 1762. The whalers, however, found the boat near Greenland, meaning it somehow made its way through the Northwest Passage, even with its crew frozen solid. Look, while Frozen might not be my favorite Disney movie ever, did anyone think to check in with Elsa or any of her ancestors? This just seems like a magical accident that could easily be undone. I'm just saying. Number two, the MV Joyita. This ship was a 70 foot luxury yacht built in Los Angeles in the United States and launched in 1931. Roland West, who was a famous Hollywood director in the 1920s and 30s, was the first owner of the ship, naming it after his wife, Jewel Carmenil, calling the ship Joyita, which means little jewel in Spanish. The ship spent much of the 1930s cruising the west coast of the United States under both Roland West and its subsequent owner, Milton Beacon. It became a Pacific patrol boat during the Second World War, patrolling the seas around Hawaii. Although she sustained minor damage after running aground and had some of her components replaced with lower quality materials, she remained largely intact and in good shape after the end of the war, and by the 1950s was being used as a fishing charter vessel. On October 3rd of 1955, the ship left API in Samoa to sail to the Tokolo Islands, a journey of about 270 miles. Only one of her two engines was running due to equipment failure at the last minute, but the journey was considered safe given its short distance and the favorable weather conditions. So it was carrying medical supplies and one of construction materials on board and had no dangerous cargo. She also carried 25 people, 16 crew, and 9 passengers, and the journey was expected to last around 48 hours. The ship was reported as overdue three days later, and no distress calls had been received. Flying boats from the New Zealand Air Force patrolled the same area that it was thought to be in for almost a week, covering a huge area of open water, but found nothing. Finally, almost five weeks later, on November 10th, the merchant ship Tuvalu, traveling to the Funafuti Atoll, more than 600 miles to the west, saw a ship drift drifting ahead of them. The ship did not respond to hails from Tuvalu, and the captain decided to investigate further. Investigations showed that the ship was empty, the crew and passengers were missing, and tons of cargo from the ship was lost. So while the ship itself was perfectly fine and in no danger of sinking, there was some evidence that something had happened on board. Parts of the bridge and accompanying rooms above the waterline had been damaged, and there was broken glass inside. In addition, stained bandages were found on deck, along with a doctor's medical bag. The one working engine was found covered in mattresses, but with sufficient fuel for it to operate and the second engine was still partially disassembled and therefore non-functional. And all the clocks on board were found to have stopped at the exact same time, 10.25 p.m. Rather spooky. The communications radio was turned to 2182 kHz, an internationally recognized distress frequency. However, the radio itself was found to not work and was not broadcasting, something which may not have been obvious to the crew. Oh, and all the lifeboats were missing. Some of the story about what happened on the Joyita can be pieced together from what was found by the official maritime inquiry. Like, for example, 
it's clear what had caused the initial problems on the ship. Um, a corroded pipe, one of those replaced during the Second World War, was found to be leaking and this allowed water to enter into the hull. It is very unlikely that the crew would have been able to find the source of the leak in open water. The damage to the superstructure of the vessel seemed to be unconnected to the problems they were experiencing, but may have added to the sense that the vessel was heavily damaged. The attempts to send out a distress signal and the lack of response may have led to a rising panic amongst those on board. The fact that whatever had happened had occurred at night also may have led to a lack of situational awareness, as the damage found was minor and would have been clearly recognized as such in the daytime. However, the decision to abandon the ship, if you know that's what happened, makes absolutely no sense. The three lifeboats were far less seaworthy than the you know, ship herself, and there were insufficient life jackets for everyone on board. Furthermore, the vessel itself was perfectly buoyant even five weeks later, and the captain would have been experienced enough to recognize this. So so while it seems that those on board decided to, you know, leave the safety of the ship in the night and test their luck in tiny rafts, why they did this is a total mystery. Theories range from pirates, once again, to a mutiny amongst those on ship. The crew were never seen again, and this means that 25 people met their end somehow. Furthermore, despite the damage, there was no evidence of violence apart from the bandages, and these themselves suggest there was enough time for someone to administer medical assistance. No trace was ever found of the crew or the life rafts. And what caused them to abandon ship in the dark, only 50 miles short of their destination, remains a mystery to this day. Number one, the SV Kaz II. So this is the most recent entry in our list, and it was found adrift 88 miles off of the coast of Australia, near the Great Barrier Reef, just five days after it set sail from Airlie Beach towards Townsville, Queensland in April of 2007. According to the investigation reports, it was sailing with a three-person crew who were not experienced sailors. However, what happened to them remains a mystery to this day. Many believe rough weather conditions could be a reason. There's blame, yep, pirates or even communists for the same. The vessel was found in perfect condition, except for the one sail, which had been shredded to pieces, and the three men were never discovered. According to investigators, they might have drowned while trying to untangle a fishing lure caught in the vessel's rudder, but others believe that a sea monster could have swallowed them. Number five, the Octavius. The Octavius became more than just a legend in 1775 when a whaling ship named the Herald found it aimlessly drifting off the coast of Greenland. The scary part? With all of its crew frozen dead by the Arctic cold's mist and winds. Uh huh. To add to the spookiness, the ship's captain was even found sitting at his desk with a logbook in front of him, finishing a log entry from 1762. The Octavius was a legendary 18th century ghost ship. According to the story, the three masted schooner was found west of Greenland, boarded as a derelict. The five man boarding party found the entire crew of 28 below deck completely frozen solid, and almost perfectly preserved. The captain's body was supposedly slouched over the table in his cabin, pen in hand, with the captain's log in front of him. In his cabin, there were also the bodies of a woman and a boy covered with a blanket, and a sailor with a tinderbox in his hand trying to stay warm. The boarding party took only the captain's log before leaving the vessel, trying not to touch the remains or evidence of what possibly could have been the reason for the lost ship at sea. The last entry from the logbook was November 11th, 1762, which meant that the ship had been lost in the Arctic for 13 years. Can you imagine? 13 years of just traveling the Arctic, sailing slowly while frozen bodies lay still on board as a ghost ship? Yo, that's just like terrifying, okay? Like seeing a ghost ship sail up beside you from the fog, crystallized in frozen ice with the horrors that lay below the deck? Very sad, very sad, but also very scary, you know? Number four, the SS Valencia. Side note, if you like what we do here, make sure you always Hulk smash that like button or throw a comment down below. It really helps the channel out. Let us know what other ghost ships you know of and I'll check them out for a part two or maybe even a part three. Speaking of more ghost ships, the SS Valencia is one of the creepier ship stories. Pulling up and finding a completely abandoned ship is scary enough. Those are people's lives lost. It's scary stuff. The SS Valencia was an American iron hauled passenger steamer built for service in 1882 by William Cramp and Sons. It did many things. In 1897, the Valencia was attacked by a Spanish cruiser, Reina Mercedes, just off the Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. They tried to sink her, but nope. She was built strong and she survived. A year later, she became a passenger liner for the US West Coast where she served in the Spanish-American War as a troop ship during the conflict. Eventually, after her service, the Valencia was wrecked off of Cape Beale, the west coast of Vancouver Island, British Columbia on January 22nd, 1906, as her sinking unfortunately took 100 passengers with her. Some classify the wreck of the Valencia as the worst maritime disaster in quote, the graveyard of the Pacific, which is a famously known treacherous area off the southwest coast of Vancouver Island. That's a horrible nickname for a shallow area also, right? Like the graveyard? 
That's horrible. Six months after the sinking, a local fisherman and his wife reported seeing a lifeboat with eight skeletons in a nearby sea cave at the shoreline of Pachena Bay. The cave was reported to be around 200 feet deep. There was no definite explanation for the lifeboat's presence in the cave, but due to the dangerous seas outside the cave's mouth, the lifeboat along with its human remains couldn't be recovered. Local fishermen similarly report lifeboats being rowed by skeletons of the Valencia's victims just offshore as well. Most famous sighting? was a rescue ship named the Topeka. Some observers on board who were survivors of the just sunken Valencia claimed while sailing home with the survivors, a ship approached from the fog and the ship passing was the just sank Valencia. The crew on board apparently now all skeletons. Yo, I'm getting the curse of the Black Pearl vibes right now, are you? Like that's scary scary. Number three, the Orang Medan. That's a fun name. In the 1940s, there was a widespread story about a ship named the SS Orang Medan that had exploded near Indonesia and its entire crew was found dead under mysterious circumstances. That's a pretty good ghost story. And like any good ghost story, there's a number of variants depending on who's heard what. Some claim that the Medan was attacked by a boarding party of rabid pirates, modern day buccaneers. Others claim that it was smuggling dangerous secret chemicals that poisoned the crew and caused the ship to explode. And of course, we're on top five scary. I love wild speculation, so I'll say I think aliens did it and who are you to tell me I'm wrong? It could be something paranormal. Interestingly, despite this story being so widespread and repeated, there doesn't actually appear to be many records of this ship. So did it really exist? Or was the whole thing just a ghost story altogether? It's believed that the ship was passing through the Strait of Malacca during the 1940s. And one of its first references was that of a passing ship that was said to have picked up a radio signal coming from the Medan. Reading out the very creepy message of We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in the chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. I die. That's something out of a Stephen King book, man. The vessel was an American ship called the Silver Star, and it went out to investigate probably the scariest message you could ever get at sea. What they found they couldn't have prepared themselves for. The entire crew was dead with, I quote, teeth bared with their upturned faces to the sun, staring as if in fear. The ship's dog had died too. But most bizarre was that none of these bodies showed any signs of a physical struggle. Some believe the ship had been carrying toxic materials and poisoned the crew, and that seems possible, but honestly, Given off of what I just read, that sounds way more like it's supernatural. I think demons were involved. If you've ever seen the movie Event Horizon, this seems a lot like it was an Event Horizon situation. Number two, the young teaser. So they called me in high school. Unlike a lot of other ships on this list that had served as merchant vessels, the young teaser, true to its name, was a bit of a wild card rebel as far as ships go and was a notorious pirate schooner flying the black flag and was famous for its speeds. The young teaser had made a name for itself as a dangerous ship around Mahone Bay, notable for several successful raids, which is a lot easier said than done. I don't know if you've ever tried to board an enemy ship, it's very complicated. A whole lot wrong can happen on the ocean, and in the year of 1813, the teaser had met a match it couldn't outplay when it was cornered by a Nova Scotian officer by the name of Sir John Sherbrooke. Sherbrooke was a decorated military officer. He was a veteran of the War of 1812 and was looking to continue his path of glory, get another medal on the chest by capturing the teaser and its crew and bringing them back to the crown to face justice for years of plundering. Sherbrooke was ready to board the teaser, but he noticed that a privateer aboard it had already begun lighting their own ship on fire. Instead, the pirates had chosen to go up in flames rather than face the back in England. Now, a pirate choosing death before capture isn't the most wild story. I'd wager a lot more pirates did that than Jack Sparrow would have you believe, but it's how the teaser's legacy carries on that gives it a spot on this list. Ask a Nova Scotian around the bay and they might tell you one of their most famous ghost stories. That on June 27th of every year, the otherwise peaceful Mahone Bay is overcome by fog, smoke, and the curdling screams of the damned crew whose souls are still trapped in the bay. They say on a real foggy night you can see the burning ship still sailing through. Some people even saying they see spectral sailors hanging off the riggings. Some boaters say that they see the ship charging towards them as if it was still marauding out and about, only when it's about to crash into another ship, it vanishes into thin air leaving behind a cloud of smoke and fog in its place as if it was never there. And number one, the Carol Deering. Now we've been talking about ghost ships this whole video and you know, weird things that have happened to ships, ships going missing, but we've yet to bring up my favorite anomalous triangle outside of Bermuda, 
So let's fix that, eh? Let's talk about the ghost ship, the Carol A. Deering. It was 1929, and the Deering was returning home from the Hamptons to Barbados, passing a Cape Lookout lightship. A man on the lightship called out to the Deering because he thought the crew looked aimless. They told him that the Carol Deering had lost its anchors, which I don't know if you know a lot about ships, that's a bad thing for a ship to lose. The Carol Deering kept making its way forward, I guess the lightship didn't have any anchors to lend out or anything, where it was spotted again a few days later by a ship called the SS Lake Elon, with its captain reporting that the behavior of the Carol Deering was very odd. He described it as steering a peculiar course. And that would be the last time anyone saw the crew of the Carol Deering alive. Two days later, the Carol Deering was discovered by the Coast Guard washed up on a nearby shore. The ship was missing its lifeboats, and the decks were flooded. A rescue crew went in to investigate, and were baffled by what they found. The ship had been picked clean. It was missing all its documents, all important equipment, belongings, it was stripped to the walls. The lifeboats and anchors were all gone, and there wasn't a single sign of life in the ship, with the exception of one oddity. A beautiful feast laid out for the entire crew that had been untouched not a nibble taken out of it. No one knows what became of the crew of the Deering. There's always been theories. Some people think maybe they mutinied against their captain and fled. Some people think they were taken by the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. Was their ship stolen? Or maybe they all just went home. We might never know. You let me know your theories down below in the comments. Number five, the Swan 48. So in 2013, a nonprofit group called the Ocean Research Project embarked on a journey across the Atlantic Ocean when they stumbled upon a peculiar discovery roughly 800 miles from the very mysterious Bermuda Triangle. The discovery, which would make anybody's curiosity peak, was a sailboat adrift in the vast expanse of the ocean. With no signs of life on board, it fell upon Matt Rutherford, a member of the team and the first person in history to complete a non-stop, single-handed circumnavigation around North and South America to investigate this eerie vessel. Upon boarding the abandoned sailboat, named Wolfhound from the Irish Yacht Club, Matt described the scene as nothing short of astonishing. The interior told a tale of abandonment, with a scattered mass of household and personal items. Fortunately, no grim discoveries of lifeless bodies awaited him below deck, but it was evident that people had been there at some point. And as Matt explored further, he couldn't help but express his astonishment. Roughly where this boat was was around 800 miles from Bermuda, a whopping 1,500 miles from the United States, and he's standing on this luxurious Swan 48 in the middle of the vast ocean. And the boat, despite its you know, desolation, was in decent shape on the outside. However, it was non-operational due to a malfunctioning engine. So as Matt reflected on the experience, he described the scene inside the abandoned sailboat as the spookiest thing. Drawers had popped open, and the sound of water Water sloshing around was echoing within, leaving an impression that people had abandoned, you know, the vessel in the middle of something. I don't know what, but something. This discovery led to an incredible endeavor for Matt and his crew. Despite their own boat being six feet shorter, they decided to tow the 48 foot vessel across the ocean. This undertaking extended over the next 47 days, a relentless effort that pushed them to haggle with a passing freighter for some much needed fuel. Alas, their own boat's engine gave in to the strain, forcing them to reluctantly release the vessel they were towing. Hey, they tried. A for effort. The ship's abandonment was estimated to have occurred nine weeks before its discovery, a testament to the durability of those vessels left to their own devices in the unpredictable ocean. It turned out that the boat had been owned by Alan McGettian and his crew, who had fallen on hard times when they lost battery power, followed by engine failure, rendering the vessel without communications or navigation systems for eight days. Fortunately, their own ordeal was cut short when they were rescued by a passing cargo ship. Number four, the Rosalie or Rossini. So the mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle have long captivated the human imagination, and tales of ghost ships ships drifting aimlessly in mysterious waters only add to the intrigue. So this story, dating back to August 3rd of 1840, involves the Rosalie, a large French ship that was bound from Hamburg to Havana. According to reports from the London Times on November 6th of 1840, the Rosalie was discovered as an abandoned ship with no apparent explanation. But what makes this story even more bewildering is the lack of any evident damage. Most of its sails were set, and its valuable cargo, comprising of wines, fruits, silk, and more, remained in, well, impeccable condition. The captain's papers were found securely in their desert designated place, and there's no indication of a leak. The only living creatures aboard were a cat, some fowls, and several half-starved canaries. The officers' and passengers' cabins were lavishly furnished, and personal belongings, including women's clothing, lay scattered about. And yet, not a single human soul was found to be on board. Now this vessel, the Rosalie, was large and newly built, and it was evident that it had been deserted only recently. The cargo also included several bales of goods destined for various merchants. Now the enigma deepens when we consider the lack of definitive historical records or archives to confirm Confirming the incident involving the Rosalie. The British Maritime Museum's records indicate that a ship by that name was indeed built in 1838 with a displacement of 222 tons. However, these records alone do not prove that the ship experienced any accidents, let alone, you know, 
here. Additionally, there's a lingering possibility of confusion between the Rosalie and another ship, the Rossini, which was reported to have struck ground near the Bahamas in 1840 and was subsequently found abandoned. Mysteries often back in the curious, and the Rosalie is no exception. Whether it vanished without a trace or was discovered derelict remains a subject of debate among enthusiasts of the Bermuda Triangle's enigmas. So let me know in the comments what you think of this entire mess. Number three, the Mary Celeste. We've heard about her. One of the most famous real life ghost ships, of course, is the mystery of the Mary Celeste. And I say mystery because it's still a mystery. She was found drifting slowly through the waters of the Atlantic Ocean in 1872, sailing completely unharmed and untouched with all its sails still up, the crew's personal belongings intact, and a cargo of more than 1,700 barrels of booze untouched. She set sail from New York City with more than 1,700 full barrels of alcohol destined for Italy for distribution. On board were 10 people, including Captain Briggs, his wife, and their daughter. Over the next two weeks, the ship encountered, well, Something bizarre. Ten days later, the vessel was spotted by a British brig, De Gratia. The crew from that ship boarded the Mary Celeste and discovered it deserted. Yeah, no crew. Spooky. First thing I'm thinking is Bermuda Triangle. Always, always, always. Ghost ships, anything lost at sea, Bermuda Triangle, immediately. But apparently a British ship found the Mary Celeste on December 4th, 1872, near the Strait of Gibraltar. So, all right, so not, not the Bermuda Triangle then? No? no? All right. Yeah, it couldn't have been pirates either, because apparently they like to drink stuff. It was apparently late reaching Italy, and this British ship went out looking for her confused where she had gotten lost. The strangeness comes with the boarding. Below deck, things looked completely normal. Absolutely no signs of attack or struggle. The only things missing were one lifeboat, and the captain's logbook, and most importantly, the entire crew. Theories of crew mutiny, weather phenomenons like giant water spouts, or even consumption of poisonous foods came into play. After passing Santa Maria Island, the Azores, on November 25th, 1872, there were no more entries. Devoid of all crew, but strangely stocked to the nines with food and booze, and all the crew's personal belongings like jewelry and clothes. With no clear explanation, the Mary Celeste remains one of the most puzzling ghost ships around. They still have no idea what happened to those people. After the salvage hearings, Mary Celeste continued in service under new owners, but in 1885, her captain deliberately wrecked her off the coast of Haiti as part of an attempted insurance fraud. Number two, Lady Lovabond. A ghostly story of lust, love, jealousy, and rage. The dark history of this haunted love boat. In 1748, the day before Valentine's Day, it was set to sail as a celebration of the ship's captain's wedding. On February 13th, 1748, the ship contained by the newly married Simon Peel was carrying his new wife, Annetta, and their wedding guests from London to Oporto, Portugal. Unknown to the captain, his first mate, Rivers, was also in love with Annetta, and in a fit of insane jealousy, seized the helm after murdering the helmsman and deliberately steered the ship towards the Goodwin Sands where it ran aground, cracking the ship in half and unfortunately drowning everybody on board. And there, the story might have ended, had it not been witnessed for all the claims to have seen the ghostly ship appear every 50 years, some of them even passing close enough to hear the sounds of celebration. Apparently on the 13th of February, the Edenbridge spots Lady Lovabond's ship exactly 50 years later. It was reported seen by ship captain James Westlake, and according to his testimony, he almost collided with the ship before he could finally turn the steering wheel to avoid the collision. Dude, close call, just shows up out of nowhere? Like what? He also recorded in his logbook, the ship was headed straight for the Goodwin Sands. Other sightings have been reported at 50 year intervals, except for 1984, when the ship failed to materialize. 1798, 1848, 1898, and 1948 witnessed the ship's sightseeings. Even some boats sent out rescuers, assuming that it was in distress or loss at sea. But later, it could never be found. Yo. A tale as old as time, huh? Jealousy, that'll do it. Yep, always does. And number one, the Flying Dutchman. In all maritime folklore, this ghost ship has left quite an impact like no other. It's the ghost ship. The oldest one in the book. Well, maybe not the oldest, but definitely the most prolific and well known. The Pirates of the Caribbean, the Dead Man's Chest is literally the story of this. The legend, Vanderdecken, the captain is on his way towards the East Indies with a confidence and determination. He tried to steer his ship through the horrid weather conditions of the Cape of the Good Hope, but failed miserably. Even after, of course, vowing to drift until his own demise, you see, he apparently signed a little deal with 
you know who. He swore that he would succeed through the perils of waves even if he had to sail until his judgment day. The devil apparently heard his oath and took him up on it and now the Dutchman is condemned to stay at sea forever. Legend says that since then, they have been cursed to sail the oceans for eternity. To this day, hundreds of fishermen and sailors from the deep sea have claimed to have even witnessed the Flying Dutchman, continuing its never-ending voyage across never-ending waters. The most famous sightings, I would say, is that of Prince George V of Wales. He was on a three-year voyage in 1880 with his older brother, Prince Albert of Wales, and their tutor. The prince's log records say the following for the pre-dawn hours of July 11th, 1881, near Australia. Quote, 4 a.m., the Flying Dutchman crossed our bows. A strange red light as a phantom ship glow, which lights the masks, spars, and sails of a brig 200 yards distant. As she came up on the port bow, but on arriving, there was no vestige or nor any sign whatever of a material ship. Seen right away to the horizon, 13 persons altogether saw her. That's a prince writing, so yeah, that's a uh, pretty good uh, source material, I'd say. This is horrific. Imagine a ghost ship faded by red light pulling up towards your ship in the middle of the night, then just cruises on by. Yeah, that'd be the uh, end of me, for sure. Kicking off at number five, the SS Beichimo. Now, although many tales of ghost ships and their legend are mired in murky mystery and spotty historical records, this one is perhaps one of the most well-documented cases of a ghost ship in nautical history. Built in Sweden in the year 1914, the SS Beichimo was used as a trading vessel for routes between Hamburg and Sweden in and throughout the First World War. After the war, though, it was shipped over to Canada, where it was employed by the Hudson's Bay Company, carrying cargo throughout the Arctic region. There, on October 1st, 1931, during a routine voyage, a devastating storm blew in, and the Beichima was trapped in pack ice just off the coast of Alaska. The crew quickly abandoned ship, traveling over the ice to the nearest town of Barrow, Alaska, where they took shelter. Several days later, after the storm had subsided, the crew returned to retrieve their precious cargo, only to find that the SS Beichima had disappeared. Her captain decided that she must have broken up during the storm and so but a few days later, an Inuit seal hunter told the captain that he had spotted the Beishimo nearly 50 miles away from their initial position. As the story goes, the Beishimo didn't sink at all, and for several decades after her abandonment, she sailed the Arctic coast completely unmanned. In fact, the SS Beishimo was seen on numerous occasions throughout the following century, and several crews even managed to board her. In fact, the last recorded sighting was by a group of Inuit in 1969, a staggering 38 years after she was abandoned. Her old Ultimate fate? No one knows, but it's safe to say that somewhere out there in the frozen north, the SS Beishimo is still sailing. Next up at number four, the Jenny. Now, this one is a little bit murkier, to say the least, and historical accounts have varied from person to person. One thing always remains the same, though. If the accounts are true, then this nautical tale is perhaps one of the most bleakest and most despairing cases of a crew being lost at sea. As the story goes, the Jenny, an English schooner that set sail from its home port of the Isle of Wight in 1822, became frozen in an ice barrier just off the Drake Passage sometime in its voyage in 1823. Nearly a decade later, Later in 1840, the start remains of the ship had been dislodged by the ice, only to be discovered by a nearby whaling ship. As some accounts tell, when the crew first saw the ship, they saw seven figures standing to attention on the main deck, and so thought that the vessel was manned. As they got closer though, they discovered the grim truth. The seven figures standing to attention were in fact frozen in place, turned to ice by the Arctic cold. Things only got worse from there though, and as the crew of the whaling ship explored the vessel, they found more and more bodies frozen in time deeper below the deck. As some reports go, as the crew came to the captain's cabin, they found him frozen in place with a pen in his hand. The final note written in his log read May 4th, 1823. No food for 71 days. I am the only one left alive. Yeah, spooky stuff. Number three, a mystery. Alrighty folks, this story from 1881 involves the Ellen Austin ship, a vessel measuring a substantial 210 feet in length, sailing from London to New York. And it was during this voyage that the ship's captain, Captain Bake, and his crew found themselves in the midst of an unexplained and eerie encounter. While traversing the notorious Bermuda Triangle, the captain and his crew spotted a small, unidentified ship sailing alongside them. Intrigued and perhaps, you know, concerned, the captain attempted to make contact with the mysterious vessel for two days, but their efforts yielded no response. Fueled by curiosity, eh, 
perhaps the desire to assist or loot, the captain and his crew boarded the abandoned ship only to find it devoid of any human presence. Instead, the ship was fully stocked with supplies. Now, with no one in sight to claim the ship, the captain made the bold decision to bring the abandoned vessel with them to land. To execute this, he dispatched a paid crew to handle the task. And for the first couple of days, all seemed to be proceeding routinely, with the two ships sailing together. Then, though, in a sudden and unexpected turn of events, a powerful storm unleashed its fury upon them, causing the pass of the two ships to, um, Diverge. The second ship, now abandoned and adrift, was lost to the sea. Now this captain was determined to find the lost vessel and started a search that spanned several days. It was during this relentless search that he once again observed the ghostly ship, sailing eerily and without explanation. Through his trusty telescope, the captain made a second attempt to bring the elusive vessel to shore. He once again sent a paid crew to accomplish this task, but however, the outcome mirrored the first attempt, as they too disappeared without a trace. The perplexing and unsettling incidents involving the ghost ship came to the attention of the owner of the Ellen Austin. Austin, leading to the decision to sell the company. The new owners, in a symbolic move, named the organization Meta, perhaps attempting to sever ties with the um, unexplained phenomena. The mystery surrounding the ship remains unsolved to this day. Now, Some folks have claimed to spotted this mysterious vessel, sharing stories of a pirate ship sailing a route from London to Florida. Now, The ship, it is said, has been accompanied by haunting screams that serve as a chilling warning for those who cross its path. Legends suggest that in 1701, a pirate ship sailing through the same waters was besieged, if you will, by a colossal and mythical creature known as the Gargantos. The ship's spirit continues to navigate the Bermuda Triangle's routes, luring unsuspecting travelers. Those who venture aboard or traverse the same route are believed to be consumed by the monstrous entity. Countless lives have apparently been claimed by the sinister waves, with the vengeful spirits of the pirates serving as harbingers, you know, urging people to turn back. When we piece together these elements, it becomes apparent that the ship that the captain encountered could very well be the elusive pirate ship, seeking to claim the captain and his crew. And hey, miraculously, they managed to escape its clutches on two separate occasions. Now, numerous search operations have been conducted in the quest for answers. In 1822, a ship was recovered from the desolation of the Triangle, bearing the grim discovery of 21 deceased individuals on board. Some versions of the story indicate that among them were 43 pirates, and the lingering belief is that the vengeful spirits of the ship continue to haunt and torment those who venture into the waters of the Bermuda Triangle. Number 2. The Orang Madan The very curious tale of this ship, and it's uh, you know shrouded in mystery, continues to intrigue and perplex to this day. Despite its appearance in various sources, the story remains quite the enigma, with details of its construction and history kind of eluding us. So the name itself, Orang Madan, offers a clue, as Orang or Orang means man or person in Malay or Indonesian, while Madan refers to the largest city on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. In essence, it translates to Man of Madan, and the accounts of the ship's fateful accident have been documented in books and magazines focusing on Fortiana, a term used to describe phenomena that fall outside the realm of conventional science. Which hey, that's 90% of what I talk about. <laughs> the story first emerged in the Dutch Indonesian newspaper De Lokomotif, with a series of three articles published in 1948. The ship that encountered the Orang Madan was never named, for safety reasons, but the encounter was described as occurring approximately 400 nautical miles southeast of the Marshall Islands. The narrative delves into the experiences of the sole survivor of the Orang's crew, found by an Italian missionary and indigenous people on Teongi Atoll in the Marshall Islands. The survivor, an unnamed German man, revealed that the ship carried a hazardous cargo of oil of vitriol, and that most of the crew perished due to poisonous fumes escaping from damaged containers. According to the story, the Orang Madan was on a clandestine journey, sailing from an undisclosed small Chinese port to Costa Rica. The Dutch newspaper includes a disclaimer, acknowledging that the tale's fantastical nature while also highlighting the assurance of its authenticity. However, new evidence uncovered by the skittish library reveals 1940 newspaper reports of the incident, originating from the Associated Press and published in the British newspapers such as the Daily Mirror and the Yorkshire Evening Post. These reports introduced variations in the story, citing the Solomon Islands as the location and differing in the content of the distress messages. Nevertheless, the story origin still traces back to Silvio, Shirley, and Trieste. As for the circumstances surrounding the ship's grim fate, it is believed to have occurred in June of 1947. Distress messages transmitted in Morse code were received by two American vessels, the city of Baltimore and the Silver Star, passing through the Straits of Malacca. The message detailed a grim scenario. SOS from Orang Madan we float. All officers, including the captain, dead in chart room and on the bridge. Probably the whole of the crew dead. The ominous message continued with, I die. Following this transmission, all communication ceased. When the Silver Star's crew reached the Orang Madan in an attempt to render aid, they encountered a chilling scene. The ship, seemingly undamaged, was filled with lifeless bodies, including the corpse of a dog. The deceased were sprawled on their backs, their faces etched with expressions of fear, their mouths open, and their eyes frozen in a stare. These eerie caricatures of death sent shivers 
scratches down the spines of those who made the discovery. Astonishingly, no survivors were found, and there were no visible signs of injury on the lifeless crew members. The attempt to tow the boat to a nearby port was abruptly halted when a fire erupted in the ship's cargo hold. This unexpected blaze forced the boarding party to evacuate hastily, leaving the ship behind. Ultimately, the ship met its explosive end, sinking into the depths of the unknown waters. Number 1. Not Just Old Wives Tales Alrighty folks, we've officially made it to the most recent incident on today's list. In July of 2015, two young boys, Austin Stephanos and Perry Cohen, went on a fishing trip in their 19 foot boat. The duo were avid fishers and would go fishing in an area not far offshore and would usually routinely check in with their parents, like every couple of hours. Good boys. Now, Stefano's grandfather told reporters that his grandson had operated the boat about 20 times and that family members were comfortable with him operating said boat. About a week prior to the boys' disappearance, Stefano's had been stopped by a marine patrol officer for a routine check, and all safety equipment mandated by Florida law was aboard the boat. The night prior to their disappearance, Cohen and Stefano spent the night together at Stefano's home before planning to go fishing the next morning. Although Cohen had told a friend that they were planning to head to the Bahamas, they were last seen at a local yacht club in Marina where they spent about 100 bucks on gas. Makes sense. And Stefano's texted his parents around 11.25 that morning and they left the marina sometime before noon. Shortly after they left though, a line of thunderstorms were documented moving towards the area and the National Weather Service issued a special marine warning that warned of heavy rains and winds potentially in excess of 40 miles per hour. It is believed that the two boys were overtaken by the storm, as Stefano's cell phone was disconnected from the internet around 1.15 pm. Despite the 15,000 square nautical mile wide surge by the Coast Guard, the pair's boat was found a year later off the coast of Bermuda and the boys were never seen again. Kick it off at number 5, the Kaz 2, which perhaps is one of the most terrifying modern instances of the term ghost ship and one of the most profoundly tragic unsolved mysteries of the deep blue sea. The Kaz 2, which was publicly dubbed the ghost yacht, was a 9.8 meter catamaran which was found drifting listlessly 88 nautical miles off the northeastern coast of Australia on the 20th of April 2007. The three men aboard, who were all residents of Perth in Western Australia, were all incredibly experienced sailors. They were 56 year old Derek Batten and brother. Peter Tunstead and James Tunstead, who were 69 and 63 respectively. Their whereabouts still remains a mystery to this day, and the fate of these three men perhaps may never be known. What made it even stranger is that when the Kaz 2 was eventually found by the Coast Guard, there were no signs of distress, no signs of boat damage, or even a struggle between the three men. It was as if they just vanished out of thin air. Coffee cups were left out, and all the life jackets on board remained stowed away, indicating that the trio never felt at risk. And in even more curious turn of events, rescue teams discovered video footage of the three men on a handheld camera, seemingly hours before they disappeared. It showed them fishing, relaxing in the sun with the motor off, and offered no clues as to how these three experienced sailors disappeared at sea. Although an inquiry was later drawn, no definitive conclusions were ever reached, and only theories remain about the ultimate fate of the Kaz 2. Coming in at number four. Or the Lady Lover Bond. Of course, no list would be complete without a good old sea shanty of jilted lovers and ghostly revenge. As the legend goes, the Lady Lover Bond was a schooner that is alleged to have been wrecked on the Goodwin Sands just off the southern coast of Kent on the 13th of February 1749. But if you ask any old sailor worth their salt, they'll tell you that it just so happens to have a habit of reappearing every 50 or so years as a ghost ship. As the story goes, the captain of the ship, a man named Simon Reed, had just been married to his bride. Anetta and was celebrating the joyous occasion with a cruise bound for Oporto in Portugal. Now, it is high time to mention that a long standing sailor's superstition was that back in the day it was grave bad luck to bring a woman on board, and in many ways, the legend of the Lady Lover Bond is a cautionary tale that exemplifies that fact. According to the tale, the ship's first mate, a man named John Rivers, was a rival for the hand of the captain's young wife, and in a jealous fit of rage, he killed the crewman manning the ship's wheel and steered the vessel into to the treacherous Goodwin Sands, killing absolutely everyone on board. And if you're asking me, that is a stark overreaction. But nevertheless, since that fateful day in 1749, the Lady Lover Bond has been sighted on numerous occasions with an ethereal, ghostly glow, eternally bound to wander the ocean. Coming in at number three, the SS Valencia. Now, this one's a little bit more interesting, to say the least, because it's a verified fact that the wreckage of the SS Valencia can still 
still be seen to this day, scattered along the beach and rocky shoreline of Vancouver Island's West Coast Trail. After the ship struck a reef during a storm in 1906, the wreckage of the SS Valencia was considered to be the worst maritime disaster along the western North American coast, otherwise known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. The Valencia was a small ship, a passenger steamer that had a long history of carrying both passengers, cargo and troops, but at the time of her ruin she was operating as a tour boat, often running routes from San Francisco and up to Seattle. During the wreckage, tragically 136 souls were lost, with rescue efforts unable to access the Valencia in the ravaging storm. But our ghostly tale lies with those that tried to escape. You see, as the legend goes, in panic the crew launched all of the Valencia's lifeboats, going against the captain's orders, all of which went horribly wrong. Three flipped on descent, dozens more capsized after reaching the water, and the last one disappeared out into the waves. Since the disaster of the SS Valencia, countless sailors and fishermen have reported sightings of these lifeboats listlessly floating upon the water during particularly calm days at sea. As some of the tales go, these lifeboats are still filled with the skeletal remains of the lost souls of the SS Valencia. Next up at number two, the Copenhagen. And it's quite the title really because the Copenhagen is considered by most to be one of the greatest maritime mysteries of the modern era, with only whispers, rumours and speculation as to its ultimate fate. Built for the Danish East Asiatic Trading Company in 1921, it was the world's largest sailing ship at the time, and primarily served as a sail training vessel for young cadets. In the eyes of many, it was the most impressive sailing ship ever built. However, as the story goes, on September 21st, 1928, the Copenhagen departed from northern Jutland for Buenos Aires on its 10th and ultimately final voyage. A total of 75 people were aboard and the journey was planned to span all the way to Melbourne, Australia and then back to Europe. But tragically, as we know, it was never seen again. The thing was though, the captain of the ship, Hans Andersen, was renowned for going long periods at sea without sending any messages, and so it wasn't until nearly six months later that the Danish company sent a search party. No wreckage or remains have ever been found, however, following the next several years of the Copenhagen's disappearance, there were a number of highly reputable sightings of a five-masted ship that fit perfectly its description. In July of 1930, the crew of an Argentine freighter sighted what they refer to as a phantom ship during a gale. Their captain noted in his records that this may be the wrath of the Copenhagen. Dozens of stories and tales have perpetuated around the ultimate fate of the Copenhagen, but the truth is we may never know. In all likelihood though, it's still out there, somewhere, floating on the endless tide. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the seabird. And this story is the literal definition of a ghost ship and one of the most saltiest sea yarns that I've heard spun in a while. Although this one has a few more twists and turns that you may not have first seen coming. As the legend goes, in the year 1750, a vessel named the Seabird was idling off the coast of Newport Harbour in Rhode Island and had quickly attracted quite a crowd on the shore due to its elaborate craftsmanship. Soon enough though, the crowd of onlookers noticed that there was something strange about the Seabird. There was no one manning the ship, not a soul in sight. As the legend goes, several moments later, the ship, as if by a supernatural wind, perfectly sailed itself through the rough breakers of the beach, gently landing on the nearby Easton's Beach. There, a few brave souls boarded the vessel, only to find the seabird completely deserted, save for a boiling kettle on the stove, and strangely enough, breakfast already prepared at the table. Now, some accounts state that a group of fishermen had passed the seabird a few hours before and had even spoken to the captain themselves. Where had the crew gone? What had happened in the few hours that had passed since their last sighting? The truth of it is that no one may ever know, and such is the nature of ghostly tales from the sea. But, well, this is where things get a little stranger still, and take this final caveat with a pinch of sea salt. But as the legend goes, decades later, an old sailor reported to a New England journalist his deepest, darkest secret. In a fit of rage, he had murdered his entire crew just before making port, throwing their bodies into the ocean. And the name of that ship? Well, the Seabird, of course. In fifth place, we have the Mary Celeste. Probably the most famous mystery ship on our list today is the Mary Celeste, a merchant brigantine that was found drifting in December of 1872 off the Azores with her crew of 10 
nowhere to be found. The Canadian brigantine Die Grazia found her in a disheveled but seaworthy condition under partial sail and with her lifeboat missing. Now the ship was, yep, yeah, missing a lifeboat. There were signs that something had gone wrong, and to be specific, one of its pumps was dismantled. But the ship was still seaworthy, and there was no hint as to why the crew and passengers had abandoned it. The last entry in her log was dated 10 days earlier. She had left New York City for Genoa on November 7th, and you know, still had plenty of provisions when she was found. Her cargo of alcohol was intact, and the captain's and crew's personal belongings were undisturbed. None of those who had been on board were ever seen or heard from ever again. Among the missing was the captain, his wife, and their very young daughter. On December 23rd of 1872, during a court hearing to try and establish just what happened, Frederick Solly Flood, who was the Attorney General of Gibraltar, ordered an examination of the Mary Celeste, which was carried out by John Austin, surveyor of shipping, with the assistance of a diver, Ricardo Puntanato. Austin noted cuts on each side of the bow, caused by a sharp instrument, and found possible traces of scarlet fluid on the captain's sword. His report emphasized that the ship did not appear to have been struck by heavy weather, citing a vial of sewing machine oil found upright in its place. Now, Austin did not acknowledge that the vial might have been replaced since the abandonment, nor did the court raise this point. Fortunato's report on the hull concluded that the ship had not been involved in a collision or run aground. A further inspection by a group of Royal Navy captains endorsed Austin's opinion that the cuts in the bow had been caused deliberately. They also discovered stains on one of the ship's rails that might have been bodily liquids, together with a deep mark possibly caused by an axe. Now, these findings strengthened flood suspicions that human wrongdoing, rather than natural disaster, lay behind the mystery. On January 22nd of 1873, he sent the reports to the Board of Trade in London, adding his own conclusion that the crew had got at the alcohol on board and killed the Briggs family and the ship's officers in a drunken frenzy. They had cut the bows to simulate a collision, then fled in the yawl to suffer an unknown fate. Flood thought that Morehouse and his men were hiding something, specifically that Mary Celeste had been abandoned in a more easterly location, and that the log had been doctor. He just couldn't accept that the Mary Celeste could have traveled so far while uncrewed. Now, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, author of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, helped make the ship famous with a short story vaguely based on the event, in which foul play explained the enigma. A 2007 theory, reported by the Smithsonian, suggests that perhaps the captain made the call to abandon ship in sight of land after the ship's pumps became fouled. Now, normally it would be unusual for a captain to abandon a seaworthy vessel, but the captain may not have been able to tell how much water the ship was taking on with the pumps broken. The ship was also slightly off course and had been battling bad weather, which may have prompted the captain to take the chance at land when he could. To this day, the crew of the mysterious vessel was never found. And despite many theories, no one can say with surety why the ship was abandoned in the first place. So the Mary Celeste sailed for 12 years after it was abandoned and finally struck the Rockless Reef off of the coast of Haiti and became stuck there. And the ship is still there today. And the shipwreck was discovered in 2001. In fourth place, we have the Patriot. Aaron Burr, the third vice president of the United States, is most famous for killing former Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Yeah, yeah, make all the Hamilton jokes in the comments. I will admit, I had the part of me are you Aaron Burr, sir? Pop into my head when I was first reading about this particular wreck. But I'm not here to talk about the plot of the musical, but instead, the daughter. So Theodosia disappeared at sea at the age of 29, along with the rest of the passengers and crew on a schooner called the Patriot. The Patriot was traveling from Charleston, North Carolina to New York City in December of 1812 with Theodosia Burr aboard on a journey to visit her father. The last sighting of the ship was on January 2nd of 1813, when a storm blew in and the ship was never heard from again. Aaron believed for the rest of his life that the ship sank and that his daughter was dead, but wild rumors flew about the ship's fate. Some said that the ship had not gone down in bad weather, but had been captured by pirates, and the crew and passengers were taken prisoner or, you know, killed. For years, there were rumors that Theodosia had survived or washed ashore dead, or, you know, that her killers had confessed. Perhaps one of the spookiest occurrences was the 1869 discovery of a painting of a well-heeled young woman in the home of a North Carolina woman whose family looted ships for a living. It had been found aboard on an abandoned vessel that had drifted ashore at Nag's Head on the Outer Banks, which is that's what she told the doctor who treated her. Theodosia Burr was said to have been bringing a very similar portrait to New York as a gift for her father. So let me know y'all's theories in the comments. Next up at number three, the Mary Celeste, which in fact may very well be the world's most infamous ghost ship, as well as one of the longest enduring mysteries of the seven seas. Built in Spencer's Island, Nova Scotia in 1861, and launched under the new name of the Mary Celeste in 1868, this merchant brigantine sailed uneventfully across the Atlantic for years as a seaworthy official vessel. It wasn't until her fateful voyage in 1872 where the true ghostly legend began, which has since gathered theories that vary from submarine earthquakes, water spouts, and attacks
attacked by a giant squid and even paranormal intervention. No one will truly know the ultimate fate of the Mary Celeste with every single soul on board never being seen or heard from again, which is a terrifying thought in itself, isn't it? The Mary Celeste was discovered adrift and deserted just off the coast of the Azores Islands on December 5th, 1872. It was a Canadian vessel, the De Gratia, which found her in a disheveled but seaworthy condition under partial sail and with one lifeboat missing. The last entry in the ship's log was dated 10 days earlier, which detailed the vessel's last known location before these mysterious, infamous events unfolded. On board was the ship's captain, Benjamin S. Briggs, his wife, Sarah, and their two year old daughter, Sophia, and eight seasoned crew members, all veterans of the sea. It poses the question what dire threat did the Mary Celeste face that caused a highly experienced captain to abandon his ship? Nothing was stolen, all of the crew's possessions and cargo were exactly as they'd left them, but in all likelihood, we may never know. Swinging in at number two, the Flying Dutchman. Of course, this legendary vessel couldn't not make this list. The ghost ship that can tragically never make port, doomed to navigate the perilous ocean for eternity. In actual fact, though, the Flying Dutchman has had such an impact on nautical culture that it's easy to overlook the treacherous tale of its origin. It is thought that the legend of the Flying Dutchman first originated from the 17th century golden age of the Dutch East India Trade Company, a mega corporation that had a stranglehold monopoly on the Dutch spice trade that ran throughout the 16 and 1700s, where tale was told of a Dutch man of war that was lost just off the Cape of Good Hope. Purportedly, every soul on board perished after being ravaged by a violent tempest. The following few days, numerous other trading ships reported seeing a ghostly, ethereal vessel out in the foggy mist of the ocean, flying the exact same colours as the Dutch vessel. Since then, the Flying Dutchman has gathered notoriety as the worst omen you could ever hope for of a phantom ship that heralds the demise of an entire crew, with sightings continuing all the way into the 19th and 20th centuries. In fact, perhaps the most recognised sighting was by King George V himself during a three year voyage in 1881 just off the coast of Australia. He noted in his personal log that 13 people had seen the same glowing flying Dutchman in the early hours of the morning, and later in the day, the ordinary crewman who had spotted the vessel fell from the foremast and in his words, was smashed to atoms. It's a little bit worrying that one. Eh? And finally our number one spot the Orang Medan. And where do we even begin with the bizarre, perplexing legend of the Orang Medan? Perhaps the most terrifyingly unexplainable instances of a ghostly shipwreck in history. But, well, the leading physical theory of the Orang Medan may be even more horrifying than it first appears. As the legend goes, at some time in June 1947, an American vessel by the name of the Silver Star picked up several distress calls from a nearby Dutch merchant ship, the Orang Medan. A radio operator aboard the troubled vessel sent a message in Morse code. In rush, confused dots and dashes, it read, We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. And then a few moments later, after even more confused dots and frantic dashes, two words came through very clearly. I die. Then silence. Nothing more was heard of them. But while well, when the Silver Star eventually located and boarded the apparently undamaged and otherwise seaworthy Orang Medan, what they found absolutely horrified them. Every single person aboard was found dead, sprawled on their backs, frozen in fear with their mouths gaping open and their eyes staring straight ahead. There were no survivors, but even more terrifying, apparently no signs of injury or foul play. Just as the Silver Star crew was preparing to tow the ship to a nearby port, a fire broke out in the Orang Medan, which shortly exploded before finally sinking into the depths. Since this horrifying incident, theories have ranged from the vessel carrying a highly dangerous chemical nerve agent, to an entanglement with the CIA after a result of a secret experiment, to an unprovoked alien assault. But if you haven't already sensed a theme with this particular list, it seems that we may never know. Five, we've got the MS Antonia Graza. What better way to kick off a list about ghost ships than with the vessel from the movie? Ghost Ship. Folks really love this one and come out in droves to sing its praises whenever possible. It's easy to understand why, too. With an absolutely brutal opening sequence and plenty of phantom fun aboard a wicked Italian ocean liner, there's a little something for everyone. The mystery behind the ship's fate is a fascinating one, too, revealed over the course of the flick to great effect. See, all we really know about this ghost ship at the beginning is that there's some sort of tampering that caused the entirety of the crew 
and passengers to be sliced in half by a very tense wire. The only survivor was a young girl as she was too short to be whipped in twain. Well, she survived the initial disaster, but being alone on a ship in the middle of the sea doesn't bode well for anyone. Decades later, a salvaged tugboat comes across the ghost ship and decides to give it a whirl. Upon boarding, they discover an enormous bounty of gold bars and an even more impressive collection of wayward spirits. They meet all sorts of ghosts who give them wishy washy answers on what happened to them, all while some tugboat crew members are lured to untimely deaths by tricky spirits. Uh oh. This ghost ship keeps getting, well, more ghastly. It's a mystery right up until the very end, and even then there's more to discover. It's more than just ghosts aboard this ship, there are demons and soul collectors aboard as well. And if you think that's the end of it, well, I've got some news for you. It's not. If you want ghosts, mysteries, and ships, this is the movie for you. And even if just one of those boxes is something you want ticked, I promise it'll work quite well. So good luck, and uh, watch out for the ferryman. Seriously, that dude's bad news. Coming in number four, we've got the HMS Erebus and Terror. Now, this one's fun because it kind of crosses the line between history and fiction. If you're big into horror TV or horror novels, you've probably heard of this tale already, as it was adapted first into a book and then a popular series. Both known as the Terror, they take a look at the events surrounding a pair of particularly interesting ghost ships, the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror. These did indeed set sail way back in 1845 on a mission led by Captain Sir John Franklin. They were meant to explore the last unnavigated bits of the Northwest Passage to see if there was anything to be learned from the magnetic data up there. Unfortunately, both ships became trapped in ice in what one day would be none of it. Not ideal, right? Well, some theorize that the deadly cold and lack of supplies were only the beginning of the sailors problems. There are many possibilities and variables when you put over a hundred men on a couple of ships stuck in a frozen wasteland, and for many years nobody truly knew what their fates were. After being icebound for more than a year, the ships were abandoned. It's said that Franklin and many others had already died by that point. With that knowledge, the rest of the crew, including Francis Crozier and James Fitzjames, went out in search of land. They were never heard from again. More than a century and a half later, both wrecks were discovered and they're both regularly explored and studied. But what happened when the ships were stuck? Why did the crews wait so long before striking out for land? Were there really no other options? In the terror, a terrifying monster is introduced to keep the plot tense and exciting. Could such a creature really have appeared? Elements like madness and cannibalism are also introduced in the fictional retelling of this wreck, which seems like they could have played a part in the real life tragedy. Still, the tales from the ships are just as chilling now as they've ever been and the fates of all those who abandoned the ships at the end are still a mystery. Did they freeze and fall beneath the surface? Were they discovered by arctic predators? Maybe they were taken in by nearby tribes, never to return to their previous lives. Someday we may find out the truth but for now, it's all conjecture. In third place, we have the MV Salem Express. The story of this French passenger ferry is sometimes referred to as the most tragic shipwreck in the Red Sea. In December of 1991, the ship was about an hour away from the Safaga port when it crashed into a reef on the Egyptian coast. The ferry started sinking within a matter of minutes, taking the lives of approximately 500 people. The disaster actually sparked controversy over the number of lost lives, with officials reporting that there were 690 people on board and only 180 were saved. Today, the Salem Express is a popular diving destination because of its surprisingly well-preserved state. Divers can still see the remains of luggage, including toys, clothes, and automobiles. Some have also reported hearing the sounds of children laughing and car engines revving. Sure, because, you know, diving isn't scary enough with all the health risks. Gotta add some malevolent ghosties along with it. In second place, we have the Andrea Doria. So the Andrea Doria was an Italian ocean liner that currently sits off of the coast of Massachusetts. Four collided with the Stockholm, which tore into the Andrea Doria's hull, causing it to slowly tilt on its side before sinking, you know, 11 hours later, the ocean liner was considered virtually unsinkable. See, I'm uh, making a face because if I had a nickel for every time a ship that was called unsinkable sunk, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Also, I'm just not big on tempting fate. The ship had been outfitted with the latest navigational equipment, including two sets of radar, and was designed with 11 watertight compartments. Now, the compartments were constructed so that the boat would remain afloat if any two were breached 
and so that you know she would never take on a list of more than 15 degrees. As an extra safety precaution, her lifeboats could still be launched if the list reached 20 degrees. Fun fact about the Andrea Doria was that it was the first liner to possess three outdoor swimming pools, one each for first, cabin, and tourist class. Now the wreck only took 46 lives when it happened, but 16 people have since died exploring the wreck. What's left is in a remote spot at the edge of the continental shelf in about 240 feet of water, and most personal effects like money are still aboard. This makes the wreck very attractive for divers, but the ship's twisting passageways have become a fatal maze for some, while others have succumbed to failed equipment or decompression sickness, which happens when divers ascend too quickly and dissolved gases bubble out of the, um, red fluid under the reduced pressure. And that's why while I love the idea of learning how to scuba dive one day, you'll never find me actually doing it. Little too risky for my liking. Despite having less name recognition than the Titanic, the Italian wreck is now considered by many to be the Mount Everest of underwater exploration. Some folks simply kneel on the historic hull, while others rummage through the wreck in search of mementos, such as, you know, China from the well-appointed cruise liner to take home and frame. And hey, every once in a while, someone gets lucky. In 2010, two divers from New Jersey unearthed the 75 pound bell that once adorned the Doria's deck. Apparently it only takes you know four minutes to reach the wreck from the surface. Once divers reach the wreck though, things can get much more complicated. The more time divers spend breathing the specially tailored mix of gases required to survive at such depths, the longer they'll have to spend making their way painstakingly back to the surface. A typical Doria dive includes only 15 or 16 minutes exploring the wreck before divers must leave. And during those few minutes, divers affix strobe lights to the mooring line to help find their way back. Some hook lines of their own, you know, wound into reels on their equipment, onto the wreck near the mooring line so they can find their way back when their uh, time in the wreck runs out. Some of those who have died got tangled or lost in the wreck. Others have panicked, spit out their mouthpieces, and uh, drowned. You know, no big. A big part of the danger is the depth and the risk of nitrogen narcosis, which once again is a condition that can occur below 100 feet, in which too much nitrogen builds up in uh, that red little fluid, causing a level of impaired thinking that is often compared to alcohol intoxication. In first place, we have the Hunley, the Civil War submarine. Marine, the HL Hunley is a ship that managed to sink not once, not twice, but three times. Look, I'm all for recycling, but with that kind of track record, someone should have clued in after, you know, the second time. When the precious kitty known as Unsinkable Sam survived more than two wrecks, someone eventually decided to keep him on land and avoid, you know, cursing further ships. Those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Just saying. First demonstrated in 1863, the ship is famous as one of the initial forays into developing combat submarines. She carried Confederate Navy men to Charleston Harbor, attempting to break a Union blockade that was limiting the city. On the very first mission, the Hunley sank at the dock when either the wake of a ship swamped it or tangled lines rigged it underwater, and caused the passing of, you know, five men on board. The sub was recovered and launched again a few months later. Some idiot on board left a valve open and it sank, killing the entire eight-man crew. The back-to-back -back disasters did not dissuade the Confederate Navy, though. Sure, I guess we can chalk the second incident up to human error, but the vibes I'm getting are raw. The ship was found, modified, and put back in service for a February 1864 mission in which it sunk the USS Housatonic, killing five. And, uh, you know, it would turn out to be a deadly mission for the Hunley's crew. The sub and all aboard were never heard from again until 1995, when a team of wreck hunters rediscovered it, with all eight crew members inside. And in 2000, the wreck was raised. To this day, no one knows what doomed the Hunley's final mission. She may have been crippled by her own torpedo, or trapped by ill-favored tides, leaving the crew to die of asphyxia when their air ran out. They may have been clipped by a Union rescue ship that never even noticed the collision, or perhaps someone managed a lucky shot that disabled the sub's captain and sent water pouring into the vessel. I guess we'll never know. Coming in at number five, we've got the Mary Celeste. Don't be tricked by the lovely name, this ship is no fair maiden. Maybe it was named for one, but that's got nothing to do with their ghostly tale. This tale is a tragic one indeed, and one that seems ridiculously risky by today's standards. A captain decided he wanted to make the trip from New York to Italy aboard his ship, the Mary Celeste. Had he decided to bring a super experienced crew and a bunch of cargo, that would be one thing. But this nautical journey was no such business trip. Instead, he decided to bring his wife, two-year-old daughter, and a crew of seven. That's a small group of people for such an extensive journey, especially when bringing one's family along. But everyone boarded the ship regardless and headed out to sea. Their journey should have been about a month, but they never arrived in Italy. Instead, another ship known as the Di Gracia came across the Mary Celeste, floating aimlessly in the sea. Assuming the worst, the crew of this new ship went to see if anyone was still aboard. But they were never able to help anyone as the ship turned out to be empty. But it wasn't totally gutted though. 
there were still plenty of supplies in the larder and the ship itself was still in pretty good shape. Sure, there was a bunch of water on the deck, but it wasn't like it was going to sink anytime soon. Stranger still, the lifeboat was gone with no indication as to why or where it was heading. So there the Mary Celeste was, without a captain, crew, or family drifting in the Atlantic. It became one of the most famous ghost ships of its era too, as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle drew inspiration from it, and used this inspiration to write his short story, J. Habakkuk Jeffson's Statement. This tale was a launching board for many theories, from pirates to mutiny to cold-blooded murder. The thing is, nobody knows for sure what actually happened. The captain, his crew, and his family were never heard from again. Now there are some more realistic theories that have come forth about the inexperienced captain not knowing the full extent of damage to his ship and ordering everyone maybe prematurely onto a lifeboat at the first sight of land. Even so, that likely ended in tragedy as well as the lifeboat never made it to shore, or so we think. And with all those supplies still on board and the ship not going down anytime soon, it feels a bit like an ironic tragedy now doesn't it? Coming in at number 4, we've got the Kobenhaven. Five masts, and none of them prevented the ship from going ghost. You'd think it would be easier to spot that way, but hey, unlike our last ghostly tale, this ship was jam packed with capable sailors. Well. Partly anyway. The Copenhagen was known as a training ship which would often take a fair number of cadets. They would learn how to best run the ship so that their subsequent journeys might go a little smoother. One would assume that a training ship wouldn't be subject to overly harsh conditions, just like how any training is supposed to lower the risk of failure during a real life scenario. Unfortunately, this was not the case. 60 sailors marched aboard this well fitted ship and once they departed they were never seen again. The ship had all anyone would need to succeed including plenty of lifeboats, an auxiliary engine and a wireless communication system. So what went wrong? Nobody really knows. It left the Rio de la Plata on December 14th heading to Australia. On the 21st the crew was in touch with another ship and all seemed to be well. After that though they went totally silent. Some think they ran into an iceberg, others claim that it could have been something more sinister. Either way, darkness and fog definitely played into the equation. For years, the Copenhagen was missing in action with nothing to show for it. However, some sailors did claim to see a phantom ship with five masts sailing the seas. Now the ghost crew hasn't attempted to communicate with anybody yet, nor has anybody been able to get close enough to confirm what they've seen. But you'd better believe those cadets are seasoned sailors by now. Back in 2012, a wreck was discovered that many believe to be the Copenhagen. However, this still goes unconfirmed. Coming in number 3 we've got the Wind Waker's ghost ship. Now we're back to some total fiction. In the most seafaring of the Legend of Zelda games, of course there's going to be a mysterious ghost ship to discover. Many folks looking back on their gaming experience recall this encounter with trepidation. It was freaky to find a ghastly vessel in what seemed to be a relatively cheerful game. Especially when you couldn't actually interact with the ship without a specific chart. It would coast around the ocean, moving from place to place based on the position of the moon. Sailing at night became more of a thrill once you knew a ghost ship could cross your path. Worse yet, if you did have the appropriate chart and made it on board, you'd be greeted with plenty of skulls and a few enemies, which tells the tale of a very unfortunate crew if you ask me. Thankfully there is treasure to be found on this ship and once you open it, the entire ship will disappear, with a really creepy laugh to boot. Unbeknownst to the treasure seeker, they'll end up unconscious on their boat afterwards. How'd they get there? Who did those skulls belong to? Where did the boat go? All good questions, but not all of them have good answers. Ask around and you'll just hear tales of terror. Apparently the person who put the ghost ship chart together died shortly afterwards, so you can't even ask for more details. Oh well, that's life. Or afterlife. Coming in number 2, we've got the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. How does that old tune go again? A favorite of dads and policy majors everywhere. Well, we're not here to discuss Gordon Lightfoot, although it is a quality segue into this topic. We're here to talk about the largest ship to ever sink on one of the Great Lakes. This monolithic masterwork full of ore was famous for playing music all the time, which would entertain those along the shores when it passed through. However, it did meet a grim fate and the story is still quite well known today. During a pretty routine trip, a hefty storm brewed. The captain was 
was aware of this and sent some messages relaying the issues, but never a distress signal. However, that might have been helpful as during the voyage that ship sank and all 29 crew members perished. To this day, no bodies have been recovered. Nobody knows exactly what happened to the Edmund Fitzgerald. After years of examination and theorizing, many potential factors could have come into play. Some say that it may have been swamped, others claim it could have suffered structural failure or even been shoaled. Regardless of the actual problem, no reports from the ship itself materialized, so it's possible we'll never know. And finally at number 1 we've got the Flying Dutchman. Anyone else have their first experience with this ghostly tale through Spongebob Squarepants? Only 90s kids remember am I right? I'm gonna have to retire in shame after that one. Ignoring my tacky pop culture worship, let's talk about the actual ship, not the green tinted underwater ghost. For ages, mariners, sailors, and other water minded folk have told tales of the vessel that can never make port. Doomed to sail the seas forever, this craft is a portent of doom. If you see this glowing aberration while on an aquatic journey of your own, bad luck is sure to find you. The origins of the ship are hotly contested, ranging from vengeful pirate tales resulting in a cursed ship to a captain selling his soul for safe passage after ignoring warnings of danger. But one can be certain that the deck is loaded with the souls of criminals and ne'er-do-wells. If you hear cries of ow, ow, or spot a ghastly green light while sailing the seven seas, good luck. Kicking off at number five, the Caliuche. And for this first foray into these particular ghost ships that haunt the sea, we're going to be heading over to the mythologies of Chile and the many legends that have been built around its coastal landscape. One of those, according to Chilean legend, is that of the Caliuche, a large ghost ship that sails the seas of Chiloe, a small island just off the coast where it only ever appears at night. The ship itself is said to appear as beautiful, cast in a bright white light, an enormous vessel with three masts and five sails each. It is said that when the Caliuche appears, it is always at night and always full of lights with the sounds of a great party and a feast on board. Quickly though it disappears plunging back beneath the murky depths. Interestingly enough though although this vessel is said to be similar to the Flying Dutchman, there is a boatload of mythology relating to this particular legend. One of these versions claims that the vessel is crewed by the drowned souls lost at sea who are brought to the ship by three mythological figures in Chilean legend. Two sisters, one of them the Serena Chilota a type of mermaid and the other the Pincoya, a type of water spirit said to protect the Chilean coast. And then their brother the Pincoy, their male counterpart who has the body of a sea lion. It's pretty cool. Once aboard, the perished souls can resume their existence in an eternal reverie of adventure on the high seas. However, there is a much more sinister version of this legend, which states that the crew of the Caliuche instead sailed the Chilo archipelago, luring fishermen and sailors toward it with an enchanting music to enslave them as part of their crew fraternity, where they are twisted and then contorted and put to work in their afterlife. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I prefer the first one, actually. Swinging in at number four, the Eliza Battle. And for this one, we're pinching the parameters of the Seven Seas, and instead, we're taking a look at one of the most notorious maritime disasters that, instead of on an ocean, occurred on a river. The Tom Bigby River, to be precise, a stretch of water that runs between Columbus, Mississippi, and Mobile, Alabama. And here we have the legend of the Phantom Steamboat of the Tom Bigby. Back in 1852, one of the largest river steamboats constructed at the time, the Eliza Battle, was put into service between the two southern states. During one particularly cold February in the winter of 1858, after the Eliza Battle had departed the city of Columbus, the ship made its way downriver, stopping on the way at Pickensville, Gainesville, Demopolis and several other small river landings. By the time that the steamboat had left off at Demopolis though, it was filled to the rafters with passengers. And not only passengers, but also over 1200 bales of cotton to be ferried to the final stop. Now although it roughly still remains a complete mystery, around 2am on March the 1st 1858, about 30 miles downriver from Demopolis, the crew of the Eliza Battle awoke startled to discover that the cotton bales on the main deck were on fire. Flames soared and quickly engulfed the ship's hull, soon spreading out of control despite the frigid temperatures attributed to the odd, gussy evening. The boat continued onward though the entirety of the exterior completely engulfed in flames and cut off from their lifeboats. The passengers, many of them who had awoken dressed in their night clothes, were forced to plunge into the icy river below. Now some of them survived mainly by floating atop the remaining cotton bales, but all in all over 33 people lost their lives, both crew and passengers included. The Eliza Battle quickly sank beneath the water, the wreckage 
wreckage of which still lingers at the bottom of the Tom Bigby River. It's said that on a particularly cold and windy night, the Eliza battle will emerge from the icy fog engulfed in flames once again, a warning sign of an oncoming ill omen. Coming in at number 3 we've got the tale of the Jenny. Now the tales I've told up until this point have been mysterious indeed. The fates of the folks on board are up in the air and may never be fully explained. The story of the Jenny is just as mysterious, especially because it's been contested by a few folks, but the fate of the crew, if you believe the story, is more cut and dry. Or should I say, uh, frozen and wet. In this unsubstantiated story of oceanic horror, the crew of a ship named Hope came across what appeared to be a ship in pretty good shape. From a distance, there appeared to be crew members working on the deck. This struck the crew of the Hope as a little strange as the Jenny had been missing for many years. When they got closer, it all started making sense sense though. The men they had seen atop the ship were indeed still there, but not alive. Each one was frozen solid, met with a frigid end. Yikes. Things got worse when the captain of the Hope decided to check out the inside of the ship where he found more frozen corpses. The Jenny's captain was discovered frozen to a chair with a journal nearby. The final entry in his log read, no food for 71 days, I am the only one left alive. That one sentence carries all sorts of latent horror with images of more than two months without food in a horrible frozen environment. One has to wonder if any crewmates became food for the survivors and what life must have been like as hope faded by the day. Coming in number two, we've got the Baron Falkenberg. Here's a general rule for life. Don't kill your brother and his bride. If you can't abide by that, maybe you deserve to be carted out to a ghost ship and doomed to roam the waters until time immemorial. The good Baron was unable to follow this seemingly simple rule and ended up in a less than savory position. The story goes like this. One day, after being missing for quite a while, Baron Falkenberg's brother returned home. Folks were quite pleased with his return and the brother proposed marriage to a lovely young maiden the Baron himself was interested in. At their wedding feast, the Baron lost his temper and cracked his sibling over the head with a bottle, killing him. The bride-to-be was terrified and ran off, but the Baron pursued her to confess his love. This didn't go over very well, and the woman told the Baron that she'd rather be dead than be with him. A very literal man, the Baron interpreted this dramatic retort as a request, and he stabbed her. Realizing the grave mistake he'd made, the Baron fled to the beach, where he found a man with a dinghy waiting. This man told the Baron that the captain was waiting for him and rowed out to a much larger ship off the shore. From there, the Baron boarded the ship, and for the past half a millennium, he's remained on board. This ship always seems to be heading north, flickering with blue flame, and filled with skeletal sailors. And finally, at number one, we've got the Palatine. Forget the Block Island sound, we're talking about the Block Island light. If you ever find yourself around Rhode Island between Christmas and New Year's, take a look across the water at night. It's said you might see an old ship blazing against the darkness. There are many stories about where this ship came from and none have been officially confirmed. Some say that the crew had come down with a terrible illness and the captain would not let them go to shore. Others say that folks from Rhode Island lured the ship to the shoals in order to take what they could from it, killing the remaining passengers. And then there's the alternate version where the locals actually rescued the folks on board and nursed them back to hell. So why is the ship on fire in the ghostly apparitions then? Well, Apparently a woman was left on the island by the ship and eventually came to be known as a witch. She got her revenge on the vessel by imagining it on fire and cursing it for leaving her alone. This idea became more popular and now the story involves a flaming ship. Starting us off at number 5, we have Yellow Jack. We're gonna set sail on a weird one to start us off. If you're a flag enthusiast, you might see the ending of this one coming from a mile away, but We'll get there in a minute. So the legend of Yellow Jack starts upon a spice and gold filled ship preparing to leave the Indies and head back home. The crew was accounted for, the cargo was secure, the captain was feeling mwah, nice. Then at the last second, a mysterious figure asked if they had room for one more. Feeling pretty good about their haul, they welcomed this extra pair of helping hands on board. Wrong move. Turns out this was a disreputable lad known as Yellow Jack with a reputation so abhorrent that the ship was forbidden to enter any port she called upon. For ages the crew sailed from port to port hoping that someone would let them dock, but it never happened. They were forced to endlessly cruise the seas, running lower and lower on supplies. 
patience too. Eventually the crew went mad and committed mutiny before they all murdered each other. Some say the ship is still sailing, the ghosts of these sea lock sailors manning the helm. Someday they may find a port that will take them and they will finally be able to rest. In the meantime, they will sail the seas, infecting other ships with the same madness that Yellow Jack caused. Now this is a spooky, ghostly story in its own right, but it could also be a reference to a different ship killer at the time. Disease. The Yellow Jack is a flag flown by ships infected with plague, cholera, and other nasty, fast spreading diseases. So, Yellow Jack itself could be a metaphor for disease, and ports weren't letting them in because of quarantine procedures. Absolutely fascinating, and it would also make a killer movie. A pirate quarantine body horror. Think The Thing meets Wreck meets Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh damn. Coming in at number 4, we have the Caliucci, a Chilean ship sailing around an island known for its terrible storms. Shining white sides, three masts with five sails, blood red. The ship sails independent of any human input. Sure, there's a ghost crew, but the Caliucci is known for being sentient. The ship has a mind of its own, it'll glide along the water at incredible speeds, and is able to submerge and continue navigating underwater, similar to the famous Flying Dutchman. When it passes, folks say you can hear the crew cackling for a brief moment. It's a ship known for the merriment of its ghostly crew. They throw parties often and hop around on one leg. The folks on board often only have one leg, because the other is folded behind their back, similar to another Chilean mythological entity. To top off their strange looks and mannerisms, some crew members have backwards faces, terrifying all who lay eyes upon them. Some say the Caliucci is manned by sailors both dead and alive, dragged from the depths and snagged off passing ships. Another legend says that the ship is piloted by the souls of the drowned, brought aboard by water spirits and granted the gift of life in exchange for their servitude. Not so sure that's a good deal, you know, life eternal but you'll always be on a stinky ship. Maybe the parties are just that sick. Merchants who trade with Caliucci supposedly become very wealthy afterwards, and anyone who has laid eyes upon it wears a crooked smile forever. Again, interesting deal. Lots of money, crooked smile. I guess you could afford a dentist and some plastic surgery at that point. Next up at number 3, the fire ship of Bay de Chaleur. Which, I mean, come on guys, that's probably the most awesome sounding title to anything on this historical list, right? The fire ship of Bay de Chaleur sounds like something that Geralt of Rivia himself would sail down to Skellig after a summer in Toussaint, but whatever, that's by the by, because this vessel in question actually takes us over to the eternally autumnal eastern tones of New Brunswick, Canada. Now the fire ship of Bay de Chaleur is also more commonly referred referred to as the Chaleur Phantom or the Phantom Ship, and it often takes the form of a series of ghost lights just before a storm, appearing as a large three-mast galley. Now the actual mechanics of this phenomenon are dubiously debated, and many believe it's caused to be down to either the weather phenomenon of St. Elmo's fire, or an undersea release of natural gas after a patch of rotting vegetation just off the New Brunswick coast. I mean, that's a completely different story entirely, but what we're concerned with is the actual origin of the fire. Ship, the history of which is equal parts tragic and gruesome. As the legend goes, back in 1501, a Portuguese captain had spent a year pillaging the coast of Bay de Chaleur, capturing Micmore natives for the slave trade. However, his cutthroat agenda was miscalculated, as a year later, when he returned to the region on his second voyage, he was captured, tortured, and killed by the Micmac people in revenge for their kidnapped tribesmen. The legend didn't end there, though, because a year later, the brother of the Portuguese captain sailed to the bay in search of his missing sibling, and upon seeing the same flags, the Micmac people attacked the ship, setting it ablaze whilst it was moored in the bay. Cut off, burning, and with certain death facing them, the sailors swore to haunt the bay for a thousand years as their blazing fire ship sank into the Bay of Chaleur. Now, whilst later both Micmac and Portuguese casualties washed up on the shores of the island, the bay itself is said to be haunted by those that perished, often appearing as distraught sailors and warriors, their flesh burnt by the fire ship. Swinging in at number 2, the Princess Augusta. And on the topic of ghostly phenomenon, this particular apparition is perhaps one of the most well documented ghost ships of the 18th century, although the actual history behind it is shrouded in intrigue. Although the folklore account of this particular vessel is based upon the historical wreck of the Princess Augusta, a ship that sailed out of Rotterdam in August 1738 under the command of Captain George Long, in more modern records it is commonly referred to as the Palatine, where the Palatine light, the apparition in question, 
question famously gets its name. And the reason for that is down to the nature of the ship. Alongside 14 of his crew, Captain Long's directive was to transport 240 German immigrants from the Palatinate region of the Rhineland to build a new life for themselves in Philadelphia. However, we know that this is the tale of a ghost ship, and from the offset, their vessel was afflicted with some terribly tragic luck. Not long after passing through the Atlantic, the Princess Augusta's water supply was contaminated, causing a fever and flux to spread through the ship, killing 200 of its passengers, half the crew, and the captain himself. The ship's first mate, Andrew Brooke, quickly took command as the survivors leapt out of the frying pan and into the fire, getting hit by severe storms that pushed the ship far off course to the north. They then endured three months of extreme weather and dwindling supplies, when eventually they emerged shipwrecked in Block Island, not far from Rhode Island. Here the tale splits, but one thing is certain, Andrew Brooke, the first mate and commanding captain, took what remained of his crew and rowed ashore, without once looking back at the cursed ship. It is said that some of the passengers survived, aided by the Block Islanders, but little to nothing is known about those that survived the entire voyage. As the legend goes, the Princess Augusta was set alight from the coast in the dead of night, pushed out to sea to burn and then disappear. At night, they say that if you listen closely, you can hear the screams of those that didn't make it back to shore. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the Duke of Danzig. And for our most terrifying ghost ship on this list, of course it has to be a brutal and bloodthirsty pirate ship, a privateer that plundered her way across the Caribbean, notoriously in the name of her royal namesake, the Duke of Danzig. This ship's seafaring career was relatively quiet for the first few years of service, mainly acting as more of a letter of mark, a deterrent more so than a private man of war. However, her fate quickly changed after changing command and sailing under the French captain, Francois Aregnadeau. Now, his his intentions were to sail and plunder his way across the seven seas, and plunder he did from Liverpool to Barbados, capturing and scuttling more ships than he could count on his way. However, despite being a vessel of the French Empire, strangely enough, sometime after late June 1812, the Duke of Danzig just disappeared, although there are several records catching a glimpse of her around Canada but she was never seen again. After the last mention of her, it was thought that she'd been destroyed by a tropical cyclone, or sunk in the night after an encounter with a British frigate. However, as the legend goes, that was not the last of the Duke of Danzig. After the golden age of piracy had been sated, a captain by the name of Napoleon Galois relayed his records of a French frigate encountering the wreck of the Duke of Danzig, drifting listlessly at sea. As his crew witnessed, the ship itself was covered from helm to hull in dried blood, and in staggered rows were the putrefying corpses of her crew, many of which were brutally crucified to the masts or the deck. Strangely enough, there were no signs that she had been in in recent battle. In fact, despite the blood, she was pristine, no shot holes, and her sails and rigging intact. After searching the ship, Galois' crew found a stack of blood stained papers, identifying the captain as the same Francois Aregnadeau. And then, as they left, the crew of the frigate set the brig ablaze, forever to be buried at sea, along with her mystery.